Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Drake. I'm the provost at the New York Academy of Art, and I want to welcome you to the 2021 New York Academy of Art commencement ceremony. We made it. <laughs> and by that, I mean across the street. But we also made it the entire year. And I can't say how proud I am of you. I know we've all had our ups and downs this year, um, but we came through it as a community, and I think it's made us stronger as artists and as human beings. So I want to applaud you for being the remarkable people that you are. So congratulations. <laughs> My first job today is to introduce President David Kratz. And I think it goes without saying that the New York Academy of Art would not be the New York Academy of Art without his vision, without his leadership, without his creativity and his dedication. So please welcome President David Kratz. Greetings, class of 2021. I am so excited to be here with you now. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, I'm just so excited this is happening in real life and we're all together for one last time like this. Um, and I want to extend greetings to your friends and family who are watching this as it streams. Um, as I stand here before you, a group of people who are about to go out into the world as artists, I'm thinking about what an incredible honor it is to play that role in our society, in our world. Artists are the people that the rest of the world thinks of as quote unquote other. They often stand outside of the rules and the rituals of normal society. I think it's true. We are, we are that. I also think it's a blessing. How lucky are we to be unbounded by normal rules? We get to make essential use of our position as outsiders and observers. We're the ones who, in seeing what most people don't see, show the rest of the world what it means to be ourselves, what it feels like to be someone other than ourselves through what we depict, and what it means, after all, to be human. We make art to know ourselves, to locate ourselves in relation to others, and to feel more alive. At its best, art is made at the intersection of the intimate and the universal. And by that I mean it has extraordinary personal meaning for each one of you. It somehow is relevant to everyone. Our school, with its beehive of studios, cheek by jowl, is a physical embodiment of that idea. Everyone is relentlessly busy pursuing their own ideas yet still inextricably connected to those around them through their bonds as classmates, by sheer physical proximity, by a continuous dialogue, and by a shared passion, a passion for making art. In our school, the art we make is a celebration of difference, of our differences, and also as close as we come to experiencing someone else's reality. It makes us understand what it means to be alive. And you, the class of 2021, you did something incredible. You committed yourself to making your work in the midst of a global pandemic. You couldn't and wouldn't be stopped and you made incredible work against all odds. And for that, I want to salute you, I want to congratulate you, and I want to applaud you. Here's to the class of 2021. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce our student speaker, Melanie Radicelli. Thank you, 
President David Kratz, Provost Peter Drake, members of the board, trustees, faculty, friends, family, and this year's graduating class. I want to begin by extending a huge congratulations to my fellow peers. The work each of you has created for your theses is truly remarkable, and you should be proud of all that you have accomplished over the past two years. We have come a long way from our first year painting still lives in Zane York's class, drawing and sculpting from life, and exploring the structure and function of each muscle and bone in the human figure under guidance of professors like Dan Thompson and Cynthia Eardley. In your two years here, you have completed an incredibly rigorous and disciplined program, and in doing so, you have gained a comprehensive technical and scientific education in art making. In each of your work, I have seen you develop a sophisticated perspective of our world physically, psychologically, and spiritually. Each of you has a strong voice and a compelling story to tell. I am genuinely inspired by your hard work, dedication, and achievements. One of my favorite memories studying with you all at the Academy, as you might have guessed, is our class field trips to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The experience of exploring the composition and techniques of the old masters with Wade Schumann and Thomas Germano left a lasting impression on me. On that cold November evening in 2019, a huge crowd of us then first year students huddled together in the European painting wing of the Met. In fact, there were far more of us there than Wade had anticipated. I was the one standing on our tiptoes in the back. The way he had spoken about the life of each artist on our tour stayed with me. It changed the way I viewed the works of Vermeer, Rubens, and Rembrandt. Looking closer and unraveling the story of each work's creation helped me develop a deeper appreciation for the magic of each piece. I think of Mark Doty's passionate tale of falling in love with Dutch artist Jan de Vides de Hemans, still life with oysters and lemon. His mastery of temperature, flawless edges, and sophisticated light value structure created the magic of shimmering glass, the illusion of a single impressive spiraling lemon peel, and glistening oysters that I know Joe would love to eat. <laughs> All of which accomplished through the simple dead palette. Through his mastery, Dehem transformed the ordinary into something extraordinary. And through our mastery here, we now have the eyes to see and appreciate it. Art has the power to touch the soul and leave a lasting impact on you. To quote Plato, art and architecture of a space imitates the composition of the universe, of ideas or unchanging forms by the beauty of the divine maker. Art, as explained by Plato, is the mimesis of this beauty three times removed, and it is by this divine beauty that wisdom, goodness, and the wing of the soul are nourished. To summarize, to behold the beauty of great art incites feelings of spiritual renewal. I recall Audrey Flack's final question given to our Painting Four class. What makes a great work of art? There are infinite answers to this profound concept. To offer my humble stance, I contend a great work of art is one that teaches you, one that touches the soul, and one that changes how you see yourself and the world. As evidenced by each of you, you all have the capacity to make great art and have mastered the techniques to do so. As artists, we can impart moral virtue and positivity, reveal truths, challenge and reevaluate ourselves, and steer the world in the right direction. As you enter your postgraduate lives, remember those who have supported, inspired, and encouraged you on your journey here. I would like to thank my family for all their help behind the scenes, whether it be getting me on the train each morning, helping me install my thesis, or balancing my life between Long Island and New York City. I'd like to thank my late brother, Christopher Berardicelli, who encouraged me to pursue my master's and begin my journey here at the Academy although he could not be here to help me install my thesis as part of our family tradition. I know he would have. He taught me to never give up or quit in the face of adversity. I extend that advice to all of you, to never lose sight of what you stand for and to never give up no matter what is thrown your way. Remember to be grateful for the kindness of those who will continue to help you grow and to pay that kindness forward. Many of you will go on to become teachers or form gallery relationships or pursue residencies or public art programs. All of you will continue your studio practice and share your unique vision and voice with the world. I wish you all the best of luck, and I know you'll go on to do great things no matter which path you choose. Congratulations to the class of 2021. Thank you, Melanie. That was lovely and generous. 
Um, we have a long list of scholarships and awards that can be found on the back of your brochure. Um, but we also the, want to say that the Academy is fortunate to have the support of its patrons, trustees, and artistic community. For instance, this year, David <laughs> Schaefer gave $200,000 to the Artists of Excellence Scholarship to attract the highest performing applicants to the MFA program. More than that, 30 named scholarships combined to raise over $500,000 in support of Academy programming. In addition, we have the support of so many in our community, including museums, art supply stores, and foundations, all of which make it possible to offer in-person instruction to the entire, for the entire academic year. The Academy is also pleased to continue its partnership with the Chubb Insurance as the title sponsor of the fellowship program. The Academy awards third year fellows in residence award to three outstanding graduates each year. The fellowship allows these students to spend one postgraduate year in residence at the Academy. The Chubb fellowships for the year 2021-2022 are granted to Hannah Murray, Wilbur Simpson, and Jen Smith. Let's applaud them all. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. We're so blessed we have two today. And um, the first speaker is Jean Shin. Jean is recognized for her monumental installations. She transforms large accumulations of everyday objects into expressions of identity and community engagement. She often works collaboratively with communities to help realize her projects and amasses vast collections of a particular object, prescription pills, sports trophies, sweaters, to interrogate our connection with consumption, environmental impact, and the life cycle of objects. She's distinguished by her labor-intensive process and her approach considers the artist's role in addressing social issues. She's been widely exhibited in over 150 major, major museums, including the New York Academy of Art, and cultural institutions, including solo exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Jean, we're thrilled to have you. Please come up. Congratulations, class of 2021. You did it. <laughs> Please take a moment to cherish this huge accomplishment. Take a look around you. Take it all in. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. To acknowledge this milestone in your life, to mark this achievement, I want to turn this commencement speech from a monologue into a conversation from one artist to another and to include the many unique voices in the community of artists today. In conversations, we learn about one another, share stories of our past, and discover the passions that bind us together. Like many of you, I loved art from a very early age. I recall one of those earliest memories. Maybe I was age five, digging my finger into the sand and moving it. It made a line and then a shape. It was magic. I could spend hours doing this, creating whatever my imagination wanted. To my parents' horror, on one occasion I was doing this at a Buddhist temple in Korea, where they asked me and instructed me to stay still for an hour, an hour while they visited inside the temple. An hour is an attorney for a child. So when they came out with a monk, they saw me in the sand in the forbidden area. They were ready to scold me, to yell at me. The monk stopped them. Let her be. She's doing what she's meant to do. In my memory of my first art experience, I was happy, I was content in the world. Instead of being bored, waiting, I was preoccupied making art. I was filled with time of joy. I continue to make art wherever I am and whatever materials are around me. Art is also a shared language. Like my first memory, my first language 
also had a lasting impact on my path of becoming. For me, it's Korean. The structure and the Korean language embeds a sense of belonging. In Korean, you don't call people by their first names or their names in general. Instead, you refer to individuals by their relationship. Amma, mother, appa, father, oppa, brother, emo, your aunt's um, sister. Establishing kinship between individuals prioritizes our interconnectedness. I could refer to a total stranger as my aunt or a friend as my sister. This is Korean custom. This inclusive language does not allow me to distance myself from a stranger and treat them as other, but instead see them as part of my extended family. This collective awareness values the group's needs over the individual identity. My second language is art. The ethos of belonging that I learned within the Korean language runs through many of my participatory projects. My installation Unraveling maps the Asian American arts community through unraveled threads of donated sweaters that connect our friendships. In visualizing the many degrees of separation we are from one another, we ultimately are communicating how we're connected. How can we build this kind of closeness, the sense of intimacy and belonging in a community, in the art world? How can we um, use the language of art to have an inclusive embedded into our practice? How can we see making art as an act of building lifelong relationships, building communities. Threads become both material and metaphor, like threads of a conversation or an email communication. These threads go deeper into stories of struggle passed on from my ancestors. I want to share this wisdom that, I have, that has also shaped my life through the lessons of the bamboo. When we encounter difficulties, they become our defining moments. How do we respond to a challenge? Unlike a great oak tree, standing in its grandness against all forces, the bamboo's narrow stalks bend with the wind. It must endure by making room for whatever forces come at them, and then bounce back once the storm has passed. Over the years, I have found these lessons of resilience reassuring. That strength comes from flexibility. I have observed that bamboos do not grow alone, but in the company of many, finding greater strength in being together. My projects invite viewers to witness this kind of beauty, the strength and wisdom of multitude. The bamboo grove is a community and a form of a conversation in solidarity. In one of my early installations, Penumbra, I rescued umbrellas from the streets and stitched the fabric together as a canopy. Critical to this work was to widen the holes in the middle of the fabric to let the air flow. The fabric does not resist the wind, but rather moves with it. It takes a breath, inhaling and exhaling, as it is filled with life. Remember that greatness exists not in the power of one, but in the support of many find strength growing together as a class of 2021, moving together with the wind. One of the challenges of having a conversation is that it requires me to describe in words that perhaps express better in the language of art, action, and process, not words alone. Being an artist tests my resilience. For my family, it was after immigrating to the United States, pursuing their American dream. I think about these problematic myths I created an installation titled Chance City, a house of cards balanced with losing lotto tickets. The lottery tickets promised instant wins and fast money, but most lot lottery players lose in the game of risk. The odds are stacked against winning. In reality, intense labor, hard work, and perseverance long-term are the economic forces for survival and sometimes success. In the art world, let us remember that this is not a competition to beat our rivals. Let us remove 
the capitalistic model of winner takes all. Instead, it is not about compromises or losses. It requires a balancing act, slow and steady, patience and focus to sustain a creative life. Like, like a precarious house of cards, using gravity and friction to lean on, the redundant support systems and eventually creating a foundation to build upon following over time. They provide the next level of confidence to keep going toward realizing one's voice. The following cards you'll be dealt won't be winners. It is how you act when you don't win that reveals who you truly are. Remember not to focus on the results, not instead to revel in the process, in the love of making art. Feel free to lean on your peers for mutual support and keep others um, from gaining footing. I'm sorry, from helping others gain footing. I believe art has a transformative power to turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. I see potential in the discarded, the forgotten, and the unwanted. Mainly, the transformation occurs in me, and the labor invested connects me to the core values and changes me. How I spend my time speaks to my priorities, and at best, it changes those who encounter the ex and experience art, and they too share this connection. Art is a gift, always with me to go through anything, pass the time, understand myself, reflect on the world around me, share the beauty that I see, and bring, the, bring me joy. It is also a way to cope with difficulties, process your pain. In the year of the pandemic, it has provided solace, comforting me and soothing me. Art continues to be a respite. I can immerse myself in my creative process. It is there for me when I need to escape my brutal realities. If I feel isolated, I have art. If I feel frustrated or uncertain, I have art. This comes in handy, especially in a pandemic. This period taught me life lessons and I am grateful for the gift of art. The gift is also an exchange, another form of a conversation, one filled with generosity. Speaking to a room full of gifted artists, I ask you today, what will you do with your gift? How will you share and continue to contribute your contributions to transforming the world for better? How will you pass on this gift to the next generation? Through art, I've had a conversation with people that I haven't even met from a different time period in history. Recently, I opened a project at Frederick Church's former estate, Olana Upstate, a hilltop and a sublime landscape designed by the famous Hudson River School painter. Several weeks hammering thousands of upholstery tacks to create a custom shroud of a colorful leather scraps as a second skin to a fallen hemlock 40 foot long. I, am on, I honor and mark this tree's passing while having a conversation with the artist Church he left us with many gifts, his paintings, his vision of Olana, and planting this hemlock 140 years ago when he came and saw the deforestation of the Catskills across the river by the tanning industry. This tree is also Church's gift. As an environmentalist, I continue Church's work, restart the thread of a conversation into the next generation about ecology. What do you want to leave behind for the next generation? It becomes an open discussion to be picked, by, picked up by others at another time. The artist community, which you are now part of, is expansive in time and space. It joins disparate cultures, languages, and finds new threads of conversations that have been going on for millennia. I am grateful for th those that came before me. The many people have shaped me let me take a moment to thank them and remember them. Of course, in my first language, Kamsamida. Your art speaks to them, communicates with them in an ongoing dialogue. I've been speaking to the graduate artists, but I also want to address the supports here and watching this virtually. 
just as a wise monk had advised my parents, um, I say to my sisters and brothers, let them be. Give them the time and space to do their best work, to discover the power of art, and to find their unique voice. Today, we celebrate the many voices in this room in a shared conversation about our love for art, our commitment to this collective dialogue among artists. I hope to continue this conversation off stage and into our futures. Congratulations to each and every one of you and the class of 2021. I'm so happy that you're with us, Jean. Thank you so much for those beautiful words. Um, I'm thrilled also today that we have Klaus Biesenbach with us. Klaus uh, flew in from Los Angeles to be with us today, which I take as a sign of the um, world re-emerging and the continuation of the, great, of the conversation between two great art cities, New York and Los Angeles. Klaus is the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA. And prior to that, he served as the chief curator at large at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And prior to that, as director of uh, MoMA's PS1. He was the founding director of Kunstwerk Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin, and also the Berlin Biennale. He is... Uh, He's a mainstay of the global art scene, and his career is also distinguished for being uh, one of a, a champion of emerging artists. So, Klaus, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Taking the mask off. First of all, I want to say how really, how much I admire you. Um, 30 years ago, plus or minus, I was your age, my early 20s, and I was running an old decrepit factory in East Berlin, and I was actually a medical school student, and it was always so difficult to tell my parents, oh, I'm more in the factory than I'm in medical school. And then I met a great artist. I met Marina Abramovich, who at the time wasn't that famous, and she was doing crazy things like performances, right? And that wasn't an art form that was established at the time. So she's 20 years older, looks 20 years younger than I am. She had all this life experience, and we met, and I was 25, she was 45, and she was an incredible mentor to me. At some point she said, Klaus, what do you say, what do you say what you do? And I couldn't say like, oh, I'm running this decrepit factory in the center of Berlin and everybody is like, oh God, he derailed from being a medical student. She said, well, when I'm on a plane and somebody asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm a nurse. So there was Marina not explaining what performance art is, but she would say she's a nurse. She's helping people to feel better. I thought it was an incredible answer. I loved that. So I thought, Marina, okay, from now on, I'm gonna say, I'm assisting artists to make their work. So I wouldn't say I'm in that old factory that has no roof. I say I'm assisting artists to make their work. When I'm in moments where I'm not in the art world, I still say the same, and I'm honored by that. I'm honored by the fact that in my understanding what I'm doing, I'm actually assisting artists. And I think it's incredible what you're doing today. It's such a courageous act to go into life being an artist. This is really, in all admiration and gratitude, this is really one of the most important um, activities that we have in civilization. I'm not from an art background. I'm like from a family where art was non-existent. We wouldn't go to museums. The only museum exhibition I did as a kid was Tut en Jamon, Kwanel Klein 
that was like a blockbuster, nothing to do with art. So no art, no galleries, no artists, but we're here today at the New York Academy of Art. And when I was a kid, there was an art academy that had an incredible radiance. It was the Dusseldorf Art Academy, 30 miles away from where I was going to primary school. And there was a sculptor. There was a sculptor who did beautiful figurative sculpture, beautiful drawings of deers and hares and figures. And this radical artist was Joseph Beuys. He would have turned 100 yesterday. And Joseph Beuys was like, he was like, he was, I was a kid, I was like seven or eight watching TV, and there he would be on TV, and he would co-found the Green Party, pioneer of the ecological movement. He would sing, make a clown out of himself a little bit, but he would sing on TV, Sun sh sunshine instead of Reagan, Reagan, rain, that is, was the president of the United States at the time. So he was civil disobedience, art is political, art is performative, art is not what it looks like when you expect it, and he opened his academy. He was a dean of the uh, academy in Düsseldorf, and he let everybody study. It's like, I want people to be able to study art. It shouldn't be a privilege. You should come, and if you like, be students. He got into huge trouble. He was escorted by the police out of the art academy. Just imagine, like, the dean, the president, very known artist at the time, being escorted. He made a work out of it, a postcard. It said, democracy is fun. So he was escorted out. I'm like, God, watching on TV. Because why am I even watching TV with crazy artists on TV? Because he had opened the art academy, his class, his master class, so that everybody could join. So that little kid's primary school teacher, Winfried Junge, my art school teacher, was in his free time going to Dusseldorf, going to sit in Joseph Beuys' class. So it was one step removed. There's Joseph Beuys being political and founding the Green Party and doing a strike on the, on the, on the highway against, uh, against the cruise missiles. And at the same time, that student that sat there was kind of telling us kids. And, and seriously, that is why I am in Los Angeles directing a museum, because I had this school teacher who studied at the Art Academy in Dusseldorf by an artist who was just actually fired for doing that, right? He admitted everybody. So I think, why am I saying this? I think an Art Academy is an explosive, subversive, wonderful center of energies and it's, it's such an honor to talk after Jean because she worded it so much more beautifully that artists are not only anticipating, but they're also, they're also shaping the future. You don't only have a radar what's there to come and in two years we're all gonna look at these images, but you can also shape it. So I think this whole creative responsibility and when you said, like, you all go out, yes, the responsibility is on you. As a curator, I'm always honored to assist an artist. And how does that person who is, goes to a little school in Kürten near Düsseldorf, how does this person give his speech today? I didn't have the courage to be an artist. From my family, I thought like, oh, it's perhaps better to be a medical doctor than I need to have an income and people know what I do, right? So I'm... So I didn't have your courage. I didn't have the courage to go to an art academy and say, I will be an artist. I didn't dare to do that. So I was a medical student and East Berlin, the wall fell. And when the wall fell, was a moment, historical moment, quite a lot of chaos, and I decided that I wanted to be an intern in the Eastern German government. I had, I'm coming from the West, I know how to speak English a little bit at the time. And so they said, oh God, you are our intern, wonderful, we can't pay you, but here's a fridge, here's a phone, there was no phone system in East Berlin. 
And they gave me that old factory that I talked about, like, what are you running? I'm running this decrepit factory. So I was 23, running this huge factory next to the opera house, next to the museum island. It's now still a federal institution, Berlin Biennial and KW. But I was 23, I said, oh God, how do I even pay the rent, get the heat, and do all of this? So it, and it's in my money paying job, I was a medical student because Germany gives you stipends to study. You don't have to pay for university. You sometimes get a stipend and then you can work. So with this detour of a medical student who didn't really want to be a medical student, but who wasn't as courageous as you are, all are, I kind of spent every free minute I had in this factory and made it an institution and then met artists like Marina, who I just invited to be my teacher. So I think art academies have this incredible and a huge honor and thank you to everybody teaching at the academy because I think what you're giving, I started with an art teacher, I think you all went through this in the last two years in a, in a wonderful way and finding form and finding your own form and, and how, do I, how do I achieve that that is yours in a way. So as a medical student, 23 year old, huge factory, who could be my teacher? So I invited artists. One of the artists that I invited to teach me, I saw this morning, Dan Graham. He's now going towards 80. And I visited him today and I said, oh God, Dan, remember, 30 years ago. And it was a wonderful, it's, I owe, I owe all the artists, I owe creative minds like all you, I owe my whole life. Because he was, and that is another thing Jean mentioned, that it's your generosity. I think being creative is being generous. So I have to say I'm very grateful for all the generosity, for all the incredible giving that I received from artists. So I mentioned Dan, I mentioned Marina, I mentioned like Katharina Sieverding, who was like this artist. She would I say, everything that looks like art, everything that looks like you expect art to look is not art. She, she drove me crazy because I then, as a curator, looked for everything that doesn't look like art. So, a couple of years later, the Berlin Biennial, mid-late 90s, I found artists my own generation, because of course these artists were all 20, 30 years older than myself, and that was an incredible privilege to meet the artists of my generation, like Douglas Gordon, or Pippi Lotti Rist, or Monica Bonvicini, or Olaf Eliasson, who some of you might know, he did the weather project at the Tate, where it's all about ecology and it's all breaking the pedestal and breaking the framework of what art looks like. So I met my own generation, and I think I'd always felt like the odd one out. And I think I found my people, finding my generation. And that was really a wonderful experience to finally having learning from so many artists, but then also learning from artists that are my own generation. And then I think the biggest privilege is, and that's something I'm obsessed by doing, I'm obsessed doing studio visits. Even during COVID, I did studio, studio visits on Zoom and I visited Doris Salcedo in Colombia. I visited Hank Willis Thomas in upstate New York. I visited William Kentridge. I visited Jeff Koons. I visited Marina. I visited Pippi Lotti. I visited uh, Micheline Thomas. Uh, so many artists. And I think this is an incredible privilege that if I had stayed a medical student, you learn all the ana anatomic books. And then at some point, you know it, right? You read it all. You know every nerve and every. You, as artists, are reinventing a whole new world, many, many worlds, as many as you are here, new worlds every day. So I, as a curator, that I could never reach the point where you are all making things, inventing things. So I think that has been the biggest privilege in the last 10 years, kind of like really learning with artists, learning from artists, that when you are then 30 years later, most of the artists are younger, which is incredible. And I think the diversity of forms, the diversity of opinions, the diversities of approaches, all of this 
has been such an incredible gift that I'm very, very grateful for. Etzo Modern, talking about art that doesn't, doesn't look like our art, it was wonderful to invent new formats, like I was fortunate that I could co-invent, co-found the Department of Performance Art. But then Marina, 25 years later, 20 years later, didn't have to say she was a nurse, she could say she's a performance artist. And people do understand what it means to be a performance artist. And I could do like Pippi Lottie Wrist in the atrium, which was like a wonderful immersive pool of sound and color, and you were just like nearly swimming in it. So I was very fortunate that I was there that exact moment where our director was open, and my colleagues were open, the artists. And that was a wonderful moment. We had a workshop where we had artists from all different generations, and we talked together, how do you actually collect performance art? How do you conserve it? How do you do oral history? How loud is loud? How slow is slow? And again, that was, I think, a very, very important moment. Going to California, it has been for me, because I'm in California now for two and a half years, half of the time we were in lockdown. In Los Angeles, we were in lockdown for 14 months. And it has been an incredibly humbling experience because if you can't do what you love doing, like going to artist studio visits and meeting strangers at openings and saying, oh great, I want to see what you're doing, you focus perhaps more on what you know already. How do you actually look at art on Zoom? How do you look at art on social media? It's going to be, it's difficult. And I think you the class of 2021, now we have like no mask on, and we can be here together. So that's really wonderful that we are at this moment that you can actually show your art. I was impressed in the last year by artists, like I did one studio visit with Annika Yi. Annika Yi is a groundbreaking artist, to my knowledge, to my, in my opinion, who connects biochemistry and genetics with her sculpture and who is like thinking that, oh, perhaps it's not the human age anymore, now it's the age of the microbiotics and we have to create art. And she will do the Tate Turbine Hall in London. So that's an incredible approach, thinking about, let's think about microbes and, and viruses and being invited for such a sculptural commission. Another artist I was very, very impressed by is Lauren Halsey. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Lauren Halsey just uh, did a project, Summer Everything, in Inglewood in South, South LA, where she gave, where she is giving, and she really created an incredible group of communities around it. She's giving out fresh produce, she's getting, giving out vegetable and all of, like, food, because I myself ate very, very unhealthily during COVID, but what she is doing in her communities is actually really outstanding. So we were fortunate to buy three of her monumental sculptures just before COVID. And then I was just so impressed how she is giving and giving and really, really selfless. I think you are here, you're not here for the market. That's not important. I think you are here to shape our tomorrow. You have the creative responsibility, you have the creative privilege, you have a gift. And I'm very honored that I could be part of this <laughs> moment that is important, and I think we're all working, and I'm just helping the artists, still 30 years later assisting artists to do what they do, but you are really working on a better world, and that brings me back to Joseph Boyce, because that's why art is so important. If you think, how did we survive the 14 months of isolation? What survives from 2,000 years ago, from 3,000 years ago? What is, what is a met filled with its art, and it's what you, what you do. So I deeply admire your courage, and I'm very grateful. Thank you. And we will now confer the Master of Fine Arts degrees.
Okay, Julie Barbeau. Melanie Berardicelli. <laughs> Diana Basanova. Anita Clipson. Holly Blum. Nathan Brutzman. <laughs> Gabriela Cohen. <laughs> Zoe Davis. Reggie Donadio. <laughs> Young Du. <laughs> Santiago Galeas. Caroline Gates. In absentia, uh, Gilas Gomez. And Lauren Hamilton. Jessica Hernandez. <laughs> Alessandra Hogan. <laughs> Daniel Hughes. Simone YCI. <laughs> hey Wan Kang. <laughs> Carl Edward Kaita. Kaylee Kemp. <laughs> Christopher Conk. <laughs> Arena Lakshin. Alicia Lee Lang.
Anastasia Lupikin. <laughs> Maggie McGregor. <laughs> Brenna McCann. Heather Victoria McLeod. <laughs> Matt Miserve. Aaron Miles. Anna Murray. <laughs> Ellie Caillou Ang. <laughs> Phil Padway. Thanks. Thank you. Carlos Abran Pineda Palma. <laughs> Ellie Ryback. <laughs> Alexandra Rolls. Rohini Sun. <laughs> Wilbur Simpson. Jed Webster Smith. Elena Ulansky. <laughs> Julie Walsh. <laughs> Sophia Wisensell. Jeffrey Wood. Thank you very much. Lingbo Zhu. And Joseph Zovikian. Thank you. Thank you. now confer the honorary doctorate degrees. Jean Shin, in recognition of her monumental installations of everyday objects, community collaborations, at the recommendation of the faculty and trustees of this institution, is hereby granted the honorary degree of Doctor of Fine Arts by the New York Academy of Art, and is entitled to all the rights and privileges pertaining to that degree. Klaus Biesenbach, internationally acclaimed curator and museum director who has pioneered the acquisition and preservation of media and performance art at the recommendation of the faculty and trustees of this institution, is hereby granted the honorary degree of Doctor of Fine Arts by the New York Academy of Art and is entitled to all the rights and privileges pertaining to that degree. Well, here we are. 
Will all the graduates please stand? I want to be able to say this clearly with no mask. By the authority vested in me by the New York State Board of Regents, the National Association of Schools of Art and Design, the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, and the Board of Trustees of the New York Academy of Art, I declare you graduates of the Masters of Fine Arts program of the New York Academy of Art, entitling you to all the rights and privileges pertaining to your degree. Congratulations. Yeah.